Buongiorno, benvenuti alla conferenza stampa di, del nostro film in concorso Bones and All. Prima di cominciare eh, vi eh, presento gli ospiti al tavolo partendo dalla destra in fondo. Allora, eh, il produttore Lorenzo Mieli. La produttrice Teresa Park. L'attore Mike Rylands. Uh, l'attrice uh, Taylor Russell il regista del film Luca Guadagnino il co-protagonista co Timothée Chalamet il co-protagonista Chloe Sevigny il uh, produttore e sceneggiatore uh, Dave Kajganik e il distributore eh, Massimiliano Orfei, Division Distribution. Um, I start with one question and then I open. Luca, your first American film. Why this, why there? Um, I really ruminate, scusate, parlo in italiano. Ok, ho ragionato molto a lungo nella mia vita da quando ero un ragazzino che sognava di fare cinema sul paesaggio americano, sull'immaginario del cinema americano da cui sono stato profondamente influenzato e formato e credo che forse in maniera inconsapevole ho cercato sempre di rinviare il momento, forse perché la vastità e la complessità del, degli Stati Uniti d'America meritavano una, la prospettiva di una persona un po' più matura. L'occasione si è manifestata in maniera imprevista e familiare quando Dave, che ha scritto questo straordinario copione, eh, me l'ha fatto leggere, eh, un copione che lui stava, a cui stava lavorando al di là di me ma che per appunto le vie bellissime dell'amicizia si è, è diventato un altro dei nostri modi per parlarci, visto che io e Dave siamo amici molto intimi e insieme abbiamo fatto molte cose e molte altre ne faremo. Ehm, e quando ho letto la sceneggiatura era inevitabile per me vedere nella storia di questi drifters e di queste ehm, diciamo, ehm, identità in cerca di una forma di possibilità nell'impossibile un qualcosa che mi attraeva profondamente e quindi in maniera molto naturale diciamo, tutto questo si è compiuto Hi uh, Scott with Cinema Magazine This is for Taylor and Timothy Watching the movie I thought wow it's a really interesting examination of community How do we find the people that are like us and that sometimes you know whether it's through religion or politics sexuality or in this case eating flesh Who is our tribe? Where do we find them? Who understands us? And I was wondering if the two of you could talk about when did you find your tribes? When did you find the people that understood you? Oh, boy. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. Um, for me, I think I'm still finding them. Um, i have a few very special people in my life who I rely on a great deal. Um, but that's the beauty of, you know, being able to keep living <laughs> on earth is that you find more and more people that you feel, um, I don't know, a deep sacred connection with. And yeah, I'm excited to meet the people that are going to come in, for me at least. Um, but I have some good ones right now. I'd say for me, my tribe was, uh, growing up in New York, was theater people and realizing um, that those are my people, seeing Mark Rylance on Broadway in Jerusalem when I was around 12, 13 years old, Denzel Washington and Raising the Sun. I lost my grandmother this year and I realized as she was passing and my mom and I were talking about Kiss Me Kate, a musical that she had been in when she was young, as someone that sort of struggled, as you just said, who my tribe was, where I came from with a parents from very different backgrounds, I realized as my grandmother was passing that without sound, you know, that we were, that were show people and that were theater people and actors and I felt at home in that moment. Uh, this movie, this script that we developed with Luca and Dave, that was made at the height of the pandemic and I think a big part of it was a tribalessness, was being cut off from the social contact that 
helps us understand where we are in the world, that so many of us, probably a lot of us in this room, were understanding where we were based on the story we were telling ourselves as opposed to social contact and what usually gets us by. And I saw this story about Marin and Lee, primarily Marin, because this is Taylor's movie and she does a beautiful job carrying it. Um, our intensely isolated young people without identity really yet that find affirmation through the mirror of love, through the mirror of each other's gaze. I think without giving anything away from Marin's character, well, I can't speak for Marin, but I think for Lee, that affirmation is strong at first, and I think as many people have had their experience in love too, that affirmation can quickly lead you to the same, uh, I don't know, like hauntedness and, uh, and hopelessness. Hello, everybody. Congratulations. It's Stephen Schaefer for the Boston Herald. Timote, um, I wonder what was it about this role that made you feel it was irresistible, that you had to play it? Was uh, something to do with maybe a contrast with Saving the World and Dune uh, to take something like this on? Um, yeah, you know. Perhaps some of that, that story is about someone who's on a prophecy, who's on a path that can't get off it, and it's beyond him. And I was dying to work with Luca again and tell a story that was grounded like the first story we told together, but this time in the American Midwest in the 80s, about people that are disenfranchised in every way possible, existentially disenfranchised. When he said that Chloe Sevigny, Mark Rylance, Taylor Russell, Taylor who I had seen in Waves, who we had circled a couple projects together that didn't happen in the States, and this one came together very quickly, and that Luca, unlike any experience I've had in a movie, was welcoming my input in a script sense, um, and that Lee could be taken from an alpha jock more to a broken soul, that felt very attractive. And I can't overstate, you know, like I said, Taylor and Waves, but watching a Growing up watching Chloe, seeing Mark on stage multiple times in New York, excellent to work with Michael Stuhlbarg again, Andre Holland, who's excellent in this film. This is like a cast of artists and actors that you dream of working with. Signora qua. Prima fila. Ah, va bene. Buongiorno, sono Alessandra De Tommasi di Leggo. My question is to Mr. Chalamet. I would like to ask you something related to what, uh, about what you just said about love. Uh, there is a sentence in the movie that says that love is actually what saves us and makes us free, set us free. I was wondering when do, you when do you feel free and if you agree with the sentence of the movie because to me it was very poetic. Thank you. Man, it's a beautiful question and a very personal one, but a, but a beautiful one. I don't know, I think... Well, certainly from the lens of familial love and friendship love, yeah, I'm like, I mean, I got friends and wonderful relationships here. I feel like between Luca and t my new friendship with Taylor, you know, I feel that love strongly too. And then for the other kinds, you know, I'm still very young and, and uh, I want to graduate from Lee and Marin's love. That's a love of just affirming that you're worthy of being loved to hopefully something greater. There's a question here. Buongiorno, Giulia Bianconi del Tempo. Volevo chiedere a Guadagnino, visto che questo è un film che parla di identità, arrivato al settimo film, eh, chi è Luca Guadagnino e che cosa cerca nel suo cinema? E a Chalamet ehm, è un film che parla di emarginazione, eh, di solitudine. Se anche a questo punto del, della tua vita piena di successo ti capita di sentirti solo e emarginato in qualche modo. Grazie. È una domanda difficile a cui rispondere, quindi non so se posso rispondere, perché veramente se sapessi chi sono sarei forse anche annoiato da me stesso. Um, il, la mia ambizione cinematografica è quella, eh, da un lato, di poter avere il controllo del mio lavoro che faccio, il controllo sul meccanismo della messa in opera del mio lavoro e contemporaneamente abbandonarmi al piacere assoluto di lavorare con amici, eh, persone che fanno parte della mia famiglia ormai da tanti anni e che contribuiscono in maniera profonda con la loro straordinaria creatività a creare quello che è il risultato di un lavoro profondamente collettivo. E quindi eh, devo dire che come dire, mi sento di essere soddisfatto perché ho, ho il privilegio di avere questo tipo di eh, pratica del mio mestiere. You know, I, 
definitely wouldn't use the word marginalized because the gift of getting to work with Luca again, the gift that he gave me of a career, again, to be up here with Chloe and Andre and, and well, not Andre here, but Chloe and Mark and Taylor, that's a great gift, so I wouldn't say marginalized. I think the isolation these characters feel in the movie came less from success in my, my personal life and more what everyone in this room is experiencing in the pandemic and how intensely socially isolated we were. Not that we're attention-hungry, narcissistic beings, but nonetheless, you need that contact to understand where you are. And I felt, I felt a similar disillusionment that I think Lee was feeling in the script at that point. Hi, Kyle Buchanan from the New York Times. Uh, Timothy and Luca, can you talk about your reunion with Michael Stuhlberg in this movie? And Luca, can you talk about casting David Gordon Green in that scene? Well, well, it was a delight, the idea that uh, we could uh, kind of uh, uh, summon uh, Michael to be the perverted father after having been uh, the loving uh, father in Call Me By Your Name. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, acting is playing, and playing is like uh, really having fun. And that was a great fun. And David is a very dear friend of mine. I had the great uh, privilege of becoming a friend of David. Thank you to Julia Daniel of Allan, who, when she was the director of the Torino Film Festival, invited me in the jury, and in the same jury there was David, and we became friends. And I even tried to make him do Suspiria as a director, me as a producer, and it didn't work out, but we kept being friends, and, um, and I read the script. I remember I told you, David, immediately, like one of the two guys in the, in the, in the, in the fire, I, fe I saw Dave. Uh, David, Gordon Green. I asked him if he were game for it. I said, sure. And he came and he did it. We also have an, um, a moment in which the two characters play guitar and they sing songs. Maybe one day we'll release that sequence. It's beautiful. You wrote the song. It's fantastic. Um, I, I'd like to follow up on, 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 the, on the theme of isolation. Um, you know, this film was shot in, 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 in the middle America. It, it's, it's a place where a lot of for, you know, European audiences, international, don't have, don't have access. They don't necessarily go. It's not a, a destination. And uh, what it meant for you to be there for, for, for the time of the shooting and, and how that reality affected the film, if in any, if in any way? I'm talking strictly from the perspective of how we made the movie, which was a road movie. We made base camp in Cincinnati, but we moved a lot. And it was our mandate, my mandate and our task to make sure that we were not going to give up the idea of uh, um, uh, portraying reality uh, of this movie. Uh, and it is a testament of uh, the wonderful production designer of this movie, Elliot Hosteter, who managed to create a world without creating it, seemingly. It's beautiful the way he really was able to find uh, this America within America, not on a sound stage. And how meaningful was for the cast to, to, be, to be able to shoot there rather than, than, a, than a sound stage? Maybe, Mark, you, you can start. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very, uh, very helpful to be in real places. Yeah, yeah, but the sound stage is okay too. <laughs> we actually shot on a sound stage for like a day or two. Remember? The that, right? Yeah, the, the the murder scene at the end. Yeah, but the uh, the Midwest is a very, very surprising place. Very evocative, isn't it? Of all kinds of things. Uh, there was a question there. Yeah, Louis. Thomas Cardinali per Cusano Media Group e la mia domanda è per Luca ti volevo chiedere il film uno dei messaggi diciamo più belli è che anche le persone che hanno una maggiore oscurità alla fine riescono comunque a trovare un raggio di luce un raggio, un raggio di sole ecco a te è mai capitato di avere questa oscurità magari anche agli altri protagonisti e qual è il vostro raggio di luce che vi porta a rivedere le cose sotto un altro punto di vista grazie eh, sicuramente è il piacere di, 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 di fare le cose, di, di, la messa in scena, è un piacere, un raggio di luce per me. È il privilegio di lavorare con amici che sono anche artisti straordinari come quelli qui a questo tavolo. In generale non credo di essere una persona oscura perché sono del segno del leone, sono nato ad agosto, quindi sono abbastanza solare. There. La signora là. 
<laughs> yep. Hi. This is for uh, Ms. Russell and Mr. Chalamet. Um, I thought uh, um, this is about isolation from choices. And I think when uh, kids in high school or middle school um, make their choices, they're judged for it very much. And these characters are being judged for their things they can't really control. So I was wondering if you could make a commentary and if you've ever felt judged or, um, by your choices or just a comment on it. Thank you. Well, I was, I was, um, had the honor of interviewing Taylor yesterday for a magazine that she was doing and she's into holistic wellness and I asked her what, if she could make any magic potion, if she was the Willy Wonka of magic potions, what she would make. And she said that she would make a potion that you take every morning and that it would remove your ability to cast judgment on people and to be judged, right? And, um, and I think true to that sentiment to be young now, to be young whenever, I, I can only speak for my generation, but it is to be intensely judged. I can't imagine what it is to grow up with the onslaught of social media and it was a relief to play characters that are wrestling with an internal dilemma, absent the ability to go on Reddit or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok and figure out where they fit in, which is without casting judgment on that, because if you can find your, your tribe there, then all the power. But uh, I think it's tough to be alive now. I think societal collapse is in the air. It smells like it. And uh, without being pretentious, that's why hopefully these movies matter because that's the role of the artist, or so I'm told, is to, uh, you know, shine a light on what's going on. Taylor, would you like to add something to I mean, here. Would you like to add something to, to it? Um, I think Timothy said it very beautifully. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have a little brother who's 1920-ish, uh, and thinking about him in this world and uh, the, you know, self-judgment and the judgment of others and that opinions seem so flooded in your everyday in such a uh, drastic and severe way, uh, it's so scary um, because the hope is really that you can find your own sort of compass within all of it and that seems like it's a difficult task now and is, um, I, I don't know the future of that, but um, yeah, it's, it's something that's on my mind a lot. We have the prima fila. Ben Dalton from Screen International. Congratulations, I thought the film was extraordinary. Uh, Timothy, you have a credit as a producer on this. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about, how you found that experience, and is it something you're looking to do more of? Well, I can just thank Luca again. Luca, who's fatherly with me and guiding me in that process for the first time. I think the only or the biggest reason I could even claim that is the work that David and Luca and I did before the movie started and how much we worked on the script with Kemi's Blessing, the author of the book, who's sitting right here. So thank you for that. And, um, and, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. I can't say that I was, you know, helping organize schedules or anything like that. Um, <laughs> um, but it's something I hope to continue doing and, and uh, hopefully even be able to make things that I'm not in that help, you know, bring voices and faces to screen that historically don't get the opportunity so much. We have time for one more right there. Thank you. I'm Mazza Tomasa for Nocturno Cinema. I have a question for the director. So you work uh, very hard on the soundtrack. We have the tenses, the moments, and also the kiss music. How do you choose these music? How do you work on the soundtrack? Uh, the soundtrack is uh, has different layers. This soundtrack, it's uh, um, my first collaboration with the Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, these masterful composers and Nine Inch Nails legends. And uh, when I when I approach them. Um, they, the discussion was all about finding 
somehow the sound of a road trip and the sound of the American landscape. And we focus very much on the guitar and also the, on the individual notes, this idea, this concept that the individual can make it in America. So these notes, in a way, resonate to that. This like guitar note. And also I told them, you should go very romantic. Uh, then we found cues of music in the movie. The kiss, there was something about the kiss. Maybe Dave has context about the kiss, so I'll let you talk about it. But in the meantime, we, uh, we also wanted to put a sort of like parallel between Lee uh, kind of being so uh, completely um, off the center and the music that in that period could have considered more off the center, like the Joy Division, the New Order. But for me, this choice of songs in the script just came from finding a box of cassette tapes, having been a teenager in 88, and picking what I thought were the, <laughs> the ones that made me either smile or cry, I just put to the script. And I'm, I'm so sorry, but this is all we are time off. They came twice already to call. Uh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>